Hey guys, thanks for coming. Um, shouldn't say guys, I'm trying to get out of that habit. Um, Y'all, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Paul Novaris. I'm a solutions architect uh, with a company called Anchor. Um, if you haven't heard of us, we uh, sponsor a couple of open source projects all around uh, container image security. A uh, project called um, Anchor Engine that's been around for about five years that uh, scans uh, container images, does vulnerability checks, policy compliance checks, and now we have a couple of new projects uh, that we'll be talking about today. Um, the title of this talk is like 600 miles long, which I, I don't know how I got it. Um, I wasn't really paying attention when I submitted it. I thought I was going to go back and edit that for brevity, but I didn't. Anyway, I'm not gonna, if you, know, you want to find me on Twitter, um, the slides are linked on my Twitter. They're in my GitHub repo, which is linked from there. Um, and if you want to know more about me personally, you know, most people don't care, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, today, we'll talk about, um, I've got a lot of slides. I, I usually have no slides. I'm usually not a, a big guy with slides. Uh, but we're going to keep it moving. Uh, we're going to talk about types of attacks and why supply chain attacks specifically are a little bit different than what um, most people are used to. We'll talk about uh, container image, uh, getting visibility into those images, why that's important. We'll talk about the S-bombs themselves, what they are, you know, what we can do with them. And then finally, we'll wrap it up with like a couple of um, examples of you know, how to do some of this stuff in practice. Um, so attack types. Um, I'm going to start here with, uh, I'm not going to make analogies. I'm trying to get out of the habit of analogies, so instead I'm going to tell a little story. Uh, this guy, Douglas Haig, uh, was a uh, commander in the British Army. Uh, he was a, eventually a field marshal during World War I, but he had had a long career before World War I as a cavalry commander. Um, so going into World War I, he became the commander of the British Expeditionary Force. Um, and all he had known his, his entire career was horses, right? So he goes into World War I thinking, uh, we're going to, you know, destroy the Germans with horses, right? And if you know anything about World War I, um, he, you know, he had a bad time, right? Uh, basically, barbed wire was kind of new, machine guns. Uh, horses basically had zero effectiveness. Um, Haig was pretty much responsible for hundreds of thousands of casualties at the Somme. Um, anyway, we'll come back to him a little bit later, though. Um, today, I'm going to, there's a million ways you can kind of describe different attacks. Today, I'm going to kind of use this, these two axes. Uh, left to right here is this kind of specific to mass scale. So what, the, what I'm doing here is, on the far right, it's like one attack has one victim, whereas on the left, one attack has uh, multiple victims. Um, and then, so at the top, these deliberate attacks, and at the bottom, opportunistic attacks, where you, you don't really know in advance who you're going to uh, victimize, essentially. Um, so what you'll see here, these types of attacks, we've got, you know, the top left are these supply chain attacks, right? At the bottom left, these are kind of more traditional data breaches. The top right, these are kind of, you know, state-sponsored attacks, or if you've seen war games, like a David Lightman-style attack where, you know, a guy just kind of does a lot of research and does his homework and very long, drawn-out attacks. And then at the bottom, you know, ransomware or like the, I like the Twitter example, I mean, like the biggest hack in, in history almost, and the guy like just used the time to beg for Bitcoin. Um, but these are the kind of things we'll talk about. Supply chain attacks, you'll see I've got a ton of them kind of up at, crammed up in that corner. Um, they're all recent too. All of these are from this year, except SolarWinds I think was late last year, I guess. It's, uh, um, but they're, they're basically happening, you know, every week now. Um, and the funny thing is, uh, Ken Thompson, I don't know if, if everybody knows Ken Thompson. He uh, was one of the designers of Unix. Um, he also worked on Go, uh, Grep, uh, won the Turing Award. Um, he predicted this back in the 80s. He wrote a paper um, kind of showing some examples of how supply chain attacks could, somebody could hijack a compiler or whatever, right? So these ideas have been around for a while. It's just all of a sudden they're becoming very popular. Uh, one of the reasons is all of this stuff in the red circle is, be, is, is essentially relatively cheaper than the stuff outside of it, right? So um, 
you know, the state-sponsored attacks are getting more and more expensive uh, as, you know, people's security becomes tighter, as people just become more aware, practices are better. Uh, so you see more and more ransomware and supply chain attacks just because, you know, that's where the, the bang for the buck is. Uh, another thing about this circle is that this is where the people that say, you know, it won't happen to me, uh, they'll say things like, you know, my business is too boring, you know, hackers are, don't even know about me, I'm under the radar, nobody cares about it. Well, they don't care about you, but they're, you're still going to get victimized, right? They're not on a crusade against you. Um, they don't care about you, you're right about that, but they're still going to get you, and we'll see why. Um, all right, this one, the, the iceberg, I, I hate this one. This is another analogy. It's actually a metaphor, I guess, but um, it's wrong, right? You know, everybody uses this metaphor where your code is at the top and all of the code you depend on is on the bottom. That idea is essentially right, but of course, um, whoops, wrong way. Icebergs don't float like that. Uh, they float like this over here on the side. Um, whoops, I thought that was the laser button. So if you draw this, the, 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 there's a link to this website, by the way. Um, if you draw the iceberg like this, it's gonna roll over onto its side, right? So really the iceberg is this funnel, right? And all of this stuff is just getting crammed into your project, right? You, and you think you're just kind of consuming these three items. You're actually consuming millions of different uh, pieces. And if one of them, you know, way back here gets compromised, it just works its way through the chain and then all of a sudden you've got a problem, right? Now, the opposite of this is this reverse funnel. From the attacker's perspective, it's the opposite, right? They just need to compromise one thing and all of a sudden all the dominoes fall and they've got, you know, basically traps set everywhere, right? So you can see why this is really attractive on a bang for your buck basis, uh, especially for small time kind of operators, right? They can really have a huge, uh, amount of chaos caused for a minimal amount of effort. Um, okay, so now we'll talk about uh, container images specifically and knowing what's in these images, right? So um, uh, yeah, RIP to Dan here. I, you know, we lost him a, a few months ago. Uh, but this, I think about this quote all the time, right? I mean, amateurs think about vulnerabilities, professionals think about vectors, right? So vulnerabilities is more of like a tactical way of approaching things, whereas Thinking about vectors is a lot more strategic, right? So beyond uh, CVEs, right? That's what a lot of people think of when they talk about scanning. They think about CVEs. There's a lot of other things we can look for though. You know, there's, you know, malware types of, you know, instrumented code or things like that. There's uh, software overrides are really becoming much more of a problem. Things like typo squatting, dependency confusion. We'll look at some of this stuff. And then credentials, right? People leave. AWS access keys in their image, in their repos, they end up in an image, you publish the image, and all of a sudden you've got another kind of problem, right? Um, so all of these things are, you know, C, normal CVE scans won't catch any of that stuff. So it's other stuff we gotta look for as well, right? So in the end, the problem is a lot of people think of container images as this big opaque object and you cannot really tell what's in there, but in reality, the container image format is pretty well understood. It's very well documented. Container building is, uh, we'll look at all this in a minute, and it's really quite inspectable. Um, what we're gonna look for in these images, be things like we mentioned, you know, typo squatting, uh, dependency confusion, things that will cause you to get something in the image other than what you expected, right? So in this example here, they just kind of misspelled a package name, and all of a sudden you get some kind of compromised stuff in your images rather than what you expected. Um, what could that be? Crypto miners, you know, is a big one, big problem. I mean, again, this is a perfect example of those that attackers don't care who you are. All they want is your electricity, essentially, right? Your hardware and your electricity, right? So these, you know, we've seen these get into things like Kubeflow, you know, had a problem with this a while back, um, other things, right? Uh, Type of squatting, this is a lot of the public registries and or, uh, registries are doing a pretty good job of this, but the idea is 
uh, attacker will get an image into a public registry named like Engine Z instead of Engine X, right? I mean, that's the, like the simplest form of this, where you just type something, you fat finger it, and all of a sudden you get um, something you didn't expect. A little more insidious form of this is, uh, you know, re registry or repository poisoning. This is where you actually get a compromised uh, artifact into a registry in a position where you're basically bumping something else that's known, right? So this isn't a typo squatting problem. This is like an imposter problem where the image is actually named Nginx. And either you fool the build process into pulling from the wrong registry or you've just broken into the registry one way or the other, right? Um, all of these, uh, Dan Lawrence had a really good talk yesterday that covered a lot of this stuff about how to trust these sources and vet those sources with signatures and things like that. Um, but essentially the, the, real, the real clue or the real cure for this problem is just that visibility, right? So uh, this is a mission patch from uh, a pretty infamous um, US uh, intelligence community spy satellite uh, that was launched like right after 9-11, I think. And basically their idea was they were gonna suck up all of the global telecommunications, right? They basically wanted to have total control over communications so they could see anything, right? So that's what we wanna get over our container images, essentially, is once we have that visibility, right, then we can um, you know, really get a handle on some of this stuff. So uh, what's an SBOM then, right? A software bill of materials, and how is that gonna actually help us with this type of problem, right? So. The problem is you can't protect anything if you don't know what's in it, right? People don't know what's in their images. People don't know what they're consuming. You know, that's why supply chain attacks work, right? That's the only reason they work. So the SBOM is really a, an approach um, to solving some of this, right? It is, I, I hear it a lot as the ingredients list, but it's not just the ingredients list, right? The ingredients list is just a piece of it. It's really much more like the nutrition facts, right? You get a lot more detail about what those ingredients actually you know, mean for your caloric intake, your nutritional intake, right? It's way beyond, I mean, just in the bare ingredients list doesn't really tell you a lot about percentages or any of that stuff. So there's really a lot more information than just what the contents are. Um, now, software bill of materials can be built from basically anything, right? We're talking about containers today, but you know, just a bare file system. Um, a lot of people do it from source code. Um, you know, it, it could be a lot of different things, but container images do have a lot of really unique um, aspects that make an SBOM very well suited, right? So. You know, if you build containers properly, they're declarative essentially, right? So all of the contents, dependencies are explicitly or can be explicitly described, right, at build time. Um, the image itself is inspectable, right? A lot of people think of it as kind of a black box, but it's not. It's really just uh, a bunch of JSON and tar files, right? So we can open it up and see what's in it. Um, containers are, in a sense, immutable. If you change an image, if you update it, rebuild it, the digest changes. So we have kind of a real quick check to see if an image has changed since the last time we looked at it and inspected it. So with that digest, we can tie an SBOM to a particular digest um, and say, okay, this is known good for this particular digest so we can lock those two together. So that gives us a real good checkpoint uh, for these. Um, Containers also, I mean, the containers themselves tend to be, I mean, this is not always the case, right? But tend to be short-lived, right? So that helps a lot too, because the SBOM, if it's tied to the image digest, it becomes less and less valuable the longer the container lives, right? As things drift, there are, thing, there are other projects in the works, I guess, around generating an SBOM from a running container that you could diff against the SBOM from the image that it was created from and just kind of look at what's drifting over time. Is somebody going into the container and updating packages rather than just rebuilding the, the image? Is somebody installing new stuff? Things like that, right? Um, 
Okay, uh, there's a couple of use cases here. I mean, a lot of things are around like security uh, incidents, like doing some forensics, you know, trying to make sure that what was in the container was what you expected or doing these kind of cross order compliance checks, right? License checks, things like that. Um, and then a application complexity, like d is, is there just what we need in this container or is there a bunch of extra stuff that's unnecessary in here. So uh, SBOMs can help with all of those. There's a lot of documentation on that. Um, SBOM formats, this is kind of a wild west right now, although uh, SPDX is kind of emerging all of a sudden. It's gotten a few um, kind of nods as probably the standard. I don't know if it'll, you know, I don't know if that's completely settled, but there's SPDX, there's Cyclone DX, there's this other one called SWID, which I don't really know much about. Um, if you're interested, there's a couple of slides worth of stuff here about, you know, where they came from, what their original use cases were, et cetera. Uh, it's pretty dry. Um, <laughs> it's kind of the legacy ones. Yeah, yeah, I think it's not, uh, I don't see a lot of activity around it. Uh, Cyclone D, I mean, a lot of people I talk to are either using Cyclone DX now or are looking at pretty uh, seriously looking at SPDX. Those are the two that I see like as a practitioner, what people are already using today or what they're using currently. Um, so yeah, yeah, I don't, I, SWID came on here because in the SIFT project, we were thinking about supporting it, I think, but it's not a format that we support anymore. Mm hmm Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, for anybody that's watching remotely, I mean, it's just some, some detail around Red Hat and IBM were supporting SWID, but it, it seems like it's kind of waning. Um, you know, what's in the SBOM? Uh, there's a couple of, there's just guidelines here, right? What's being cataloged? You know, what's in here? Uh, unique enumeration of things and kind of a, a, some details on what actually did the cataloging, right? The SBOM should describe what created it so you can go back and maybe try to reproduce it. Um, these things should be reproducible, right? Uh, really good SBOMs can, you know, have a, even more detail, uh, what's in scope, what's out of scope, um, you know, any kind of exceptional conditions, things that we didn't, that we in, encountered that maybe are unusual, unanticipated. Um, and then metadata, right? I mean, things like we were talking about earlier. Um, things like secrets in a, fi in, a, in a container image, right? Did somebody leave an SSH key in here? Um, there's no reason you can't have that kind of stuff in an SBOM. Um, now, SIFT is uh, a, a fairly new project that Anchor is sponsoring. Um, it's written in Go. Um, it is primarily intended to generate SBOMs for container images, but it can work against just a regular file system. We, I've had people um, try to use it against an entire VM, which it gets a little weird in some of the, you know, uh, ProcFS or whatever. Uh, <laughs> um, that wasn't really an anticipated use case, but uh, in any case, um, it can output uh, like I said earlier, Cyclone DX or SPDX, it has its own format as well. Um, Anchor had a previous project called Anchor Engine that used uh, software bill of materials internally um, to generate vulnerability scans and uh, compliance checks. And so the, uh, the other uh, JSON format that it uses is kind of more compatible with what Anchor Engine was doing. So it will output and handle any of those formats though. Um, there is also the companion piece uh, called Gripe. So Gripe takes the software bill of materials and spits out a vulnerability list. Um, it's really, uh, now that sounds like, okay, I'm doing two things when I could just do one. Uh, as we'll see in a minute though, there's a couple of advantages to generating the SBOM first and then doing your vulnerability check, your compliance checks, all that stuff. Um, both of those, uh, in fact, you can use Gripe standalone. You don't have to feed it an SBOM. It has SIFT kind of integrated in. It can generate the SBOM on the fly, but it takes longer. Um, so now what, how do we actually do this stuff? Okay, this is like um, another story. It's not, a, not an analogy. Um, probably the worst slide. This is like the ugliest slide I've ever made, I think, and I've made some pretty bad ones. Um, but, uh, <laughs> 
So things like airbags and seat belts, right? They're incredible safety tools, but they only work when you have a wreck, right? They don't do anything to help you stay to avoid wrecks, right? Whereas things like anti-lock brakes, traction control, a lot of autonomous driving features are really in, in, intended to lower the, the frequency of an accident, whereas survivability features like seat belts, airbags are really kind of intended to lower the, the impact of one when it occurs. Uh, I don't think it's an accident that most of the money is going into things like autonomous driving, things to help you avoid the accident in the first place, right? That's obviously what we would all like, you know. Um, it's not, it's harder to kind of think about, right? Uh, it, the, the, the thing, the difference between what's seen and what's unseen is always kind of hard to um, quantify sometimes, but I think everybody can agree that having fewer accidents is better than having more, even if you survive a higher percentage of them. Um, so, not an analogy, but we'll come back to that in a little bit as well. Uh, so what do SBOMs actually do for us, right? So two things, one is speed of the checks. Um, since if we generate an SBOM, we can go back to it over and over again instead of going back to the image and cataloging all the things over and over again. So we can do vulnerability checks much more frequently as we get new vulnerability definitions. And it's not just for vulnerability checks either. We can do compliance checks, um, check other things in there, but it's a lot faster, orders of magnitude faster to do those checks against the software bill of materials as compared to doing it against the, the source image, right? And we'll look at some of the timing there in just a second. The other thing is the accuracy and precision of these. Uh, you know, the, some differences between accuracy and precision, right? But accuracy is, you know, how close to reality your results are, whereas precision is like how repeatable, you know, is this consistent? Um, we can improve both of those with a software bill of materials because we can make adjustments to it. So. Things like, um, let's say you're using Angular, right? Some of the things get compiled down. It's, if you just look at the end result, it's hard to enumerate what actually went into it. We can provide data to the SBOM generator to tell it, like, hey, for this artifact, this is what went into it. And it can kind of um, put that in the SBOM where it wouldn't be easily discoverable just by looking at the image itself. Things like what uh, this guy over here was saying earlier, I didn't catch your name, I'm sorry. John. John, uh, if you do multi-stage builds, right, and you have a couple of build artifacts, you drop those into a distroless image, you lose a lot of context, right? So in an ideal universe, you would be able to generate the SBOM from the fat image before you generate, before you move those artifacts into the distroless image. Uh, and then somehow tie those two together, right? Some of these, there's a little bit of work to be done, but that's the idea. Um, so the software bill of materials can provide a lot of that context that gets lost either by, um, you know, some of these techniques that are used to slim down the images. Um, timing, this is just some example times I did on some junk images that I created. Um, these are just some uh, test images that have a bunch of garbage in them. You can see um, the bigger the image, the bigger the, the time savings uh, as a percentage. But, um, you know, this is like orders of magnitude faster, right? So, general, oh, where's my laser here? This image here has just got a ton of stuff in it. It's like a, it's, I think it's just under a gigabyte. Um, the timing's hard to read here, but essentially uh, took like 15 seconds to generate a vulnerability list with gripe from the image itself. Uh, one and a half seconds doing it from the SBOM, right? So it's a pretty big savings. The idea here would be uh, that if it's faster to do it, you can build the SBOM earlier in the process, right? If you go back to like waterfall development, security checks usually didn't come in until pretty late because it was an expensive process, right? You didn't, you didn't, you couldn't afford to do it through the entire life cycle of the project. So, you know, developers would be miserable because they would think, oh, I'm about to ship this thing, and then the security team, like, swoops in, does their checks, and sends them back to the, you know, way back to here. Um, 
Now what we want to do is kind of push this, you know, all the checks further to the left. It's because it's so much cheaper to fix things over here, right? Um, I mean, just look at the difference between fixing something in production versus something in development, right? I mean, I think GitHub came up, I think this is GitHub data. They did some surveys on this. Um, and also the fact that, you know, there are a ton more developers than security researchers, right? So the idea is with these tools, we can empower these people here to actually contribute to this effort uh, instead of relying on this really small number of people over here. Um, okay, so demos, right? Everybody likes a demo. I, I, I hate demos, right? Because what us this is what usually happens is I tweak it right before and it turns into a big pile of garbage. But um, we'll try one. Uh, but if, if it does blow up, I've got some repos here. Um, these are linked on my Twitter. Um, this is a real simple one. Uh, it will, you can set up a, like a disposable Jenkins container and build some images and generate SBOMs and do vulnerability checks on them. It's pretty simple. There's a more complicated one here um, using GitHub Actions. This one actually incorporates a project called Cosign, which is uh, kind of affiliated with SigStore. So this one will generate SBOMs, sign them, use the SBOM to generate a vulnerability list, attest the vulnerability list, and um, publish the attestations along with the artifacts. Uh, it's a little bit more involved. Um, there's a big blog post that we just published on it as well that kind of will step you through it. Um, and finally, just like, I haven't even built a demo for this last one, but we just published a GitHub uh, SBOM action that will do, kind of simplify some of the stuff as well. Um, all right, so let's try it. Uh, let's see what happens here. Let me mirror these and I will back out of this and let's see what we got. Okay, so this is my GitHub repo. This is, I've got this one pinned. Um, so there's a Jenkins file in here. You can just you don't even have to clone this repo, but you can just follow these directions. I've already got Jenkins up and running. This is just running on my laptop here in Docker Desktop, uh, I think. Let's make sure it's running. Yeah, okay, so where's my Jenkins? Oh, it's right here. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll just take this repo and I'll set up a new project, uh, create a job, we'll build a pipeline, SIFT1. And can anybody read that? Let me, let's do that. All right, let's set it up. Uh, pipeline script from SCM. We're going to use git. And here's the repo. Save it. All right, let's build it. It's building. Yep, there it goes. All right. I think it'll work. All right, so it built an image. Uh, it is now generating the SBOM right now. And once it does that, it's, uh, oh, it's already done. Okay, so that's gonna leave behind uh, a couple of things. One, I have it actually run the, the, the vulnerability check twice. So if we look in the console output, I can see the actual vulnerability listing uh, here. And then it also left behind um, the SBOM is a build artifact, and a, the vulnerability list is an artifact. Pretty simple. If you go into the uh, repo and look at the Jenkins file, you can actually modify this a little bit. There's some hints in here of, about how to like take the vulnerability check and actually cause it to break the pipeline if there's critical vulnerabilities. Or Actually, I think, yeah, right here, this dash F option, you can say, hey, if there's any high severity vulnerabilities, break the pipeline or something like that. Real simple. Um, so, wow, that worked. Amazing. Um, <laughs> the second one, I'm not going to run. This one takes a little bit longer, but um, you'll see here like what it's doing in this. this uh, basically, when it builds the image, it then will create the uh, software bill of materials. It signs the image, which you know is kind of superfluous for our purposes. Once it creates the SBOM, then it will use that SBOM as an input to the vulnerability scan, and then it will sign that vulnerability list, and then it also kind of branches off here to sign 
the SBOM itself, and then it publishes all of those things as artifacts, right? You can just scroll down here and see um, somewhere in here. Where is it? Yeah, there they are, the artifacts that it leaves behind. Um, so if you want to check that one out, that's in here as well. Um, it's actually cloned from one of my coworkers. It, it might even be better to go back to his original one because I'm kind of always tweaking these things and may catch on fire at any moment. Um, but like I said, that's linked in the slide deck along with the, um, uh, the other stuff here, this blog post, this, this is the, the more complicated repo, and then this details on that SBOM action. Um, so yeah, if you wanna go to my Twitter, uh, it's PVN. Um, there's the link to the slides and a link to the demos there. Uh, okay, so uh, any questions so far? I know that was a lot of stuff really quick. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, how is SIF creating the SBOM? Uh, and what is it actually doing? Um, so what it does is it basically untars the, the image. It will grab the image, you know, it, it could be something local, it will go out to a repo and pull it using Scopio or whatever. Basically just opens it up. It will use things like, um, if there's RPMs or DEBs or whatever, it will use that facility to catalog those. It is compatible with uh, language artifact packaging like uh, Node, you know, NPM or Ruby or Python, et cetera. So it will start with enumerating the packages, both, you know, OS type packages and language packages. Then it will go to like files, just going through all the files in the image. Um, there are configurations you can do with it to have it look for um, patterns in files if you want to get that specific. So like that's how you would find things like an AWS access key or an SSH private key. We can, you know, you can come up with pretty easily uh, regular expressions to look for those kind of things. Um, is that pretty much what you're looking for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next. That's a good question. So the question is, is it just looking at the, the image itself or does it go backwards and look and to, to try to verify the, the origins of those things? It does not do any of that work there. It's just one cog in that whole machine. I would recommend if you wanna do that entire set of things, right? This is one cog in that, that kind of tool chain. Um, look at yesterday, Dan Lawrence had a really good talk on exactly that topic, going all the way back to the hardware, right? And verifying the hardware that the stuff was built on. So yeah, I mean, it's, it gets really complicated really fast. Um, but yeah, this is specifically like, okay, I've got an image, I just need to inventory it. The, the question of where this image came from and stuff, that's important stuff for sure. Uh, it's a little beyond the scope of this tool. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, this does not solve every problem we talked about today. Okay. Absolutely correct. Yeah, yeah. There's you the starting place to start doing this forensics. Right. Yeah, that is that is 100% correct. Yeah, I don't want anybody to think this is a silver bullet and like all your problems are solved, right? Yeah, there <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I mean, I would it would probably yeah, there'd be a couple of Nobel prizes in it, I'm sure, right? Um any other questions? I don't know if we had any on, online. Let me just check. Uh, it doesn't look like, uh, I don't think that those are for me. Those look like those are older. Okay, um, I will go back here, just a couple of other things, um, some takeaways and whatnot, right? I mean, best practices, how do I get this big again? There we go. Um, okay, yeah, so best practices here, I mean, this is kind of, you know, uh, basic stuff, but it bears repeating, right? Um, centralize your CI/CD pipelines, right? Don't you know have people just setting up you know unsecured Jenkins servers all over the place? Uh, build from trusted sources, right? I mean that's not again, it's easy to say that. It's harder to actually enforce it. Um, automate as much as you can, though, right? Security testing, vulnerability checks, uh, policy enforcement. So when you have S bombs, you can do things like look at. Um, 
let's say like the, inf you, could, you can have something like the Docker file, right? And look at where the base image is coming from, right? And say, is it pulling from a known good source, right? Look at the digest of the base image, right? You can enforce, if there's a list, you could, I mean, the basic, the easiest way to do this would be say, I only allow base images from this known repository, right? Do not pull Alpine latest from Docker Hub, only pull from, you know, example.com slash Alpine or whatever, right? That's better than nothing. Having a list of digests that are approved is even better, right? Um, and then, of course... All my containers from UBI images. Right. Yeah, and you can verify, like, so a lot of times, right, people will put the, the bare UBI image in their internal registry, but they will vet it first before they let everybody use it, right, and say, okay, this is a known good one, we'll bless it, here's the digest, it's, it's okay to use this one, right? But don't pull it directly from RHEL, right, because we don't know what'll happen in between on the network or whatever, right? I mean, there's a million things that could go wrong. Um, so yeah, and then just you know, deploy trusted images into production. That could be something as simple as like a Kubernetes admission controller to say, before I deploy, do I have an SBOM for this image, right? If I have one, great. If I don't have one, all of a sudden I think, oh my God, something's off the rails. Somebody's trying to deploy something that we haven't seen before. Huge red flag that the process is being circumvented, right? Uh, that's, a pretty, that's actually a pretty easy check to make. Um, so, uh, we did the questions already. So I'm gonna continue on with takeaways here. Um, this one here, uh, this is about, uh, we talked earlier about you know, satellites that are in, in intercepting telecommunications. Since that happened, right, end-to-end -end encryption has become a lot more prevalent, which has made those kind of uh, surveillance operations a lot less effective, right? The people they want to intercept their, their communications are not talking in the clear anymore, right? So, Intelligence agencies have had to move from these huge, cheap, mass scale operations to these really expensive targeted attacks. And they're higher risk because they can be detected, right? When you're just ab absorbing everything, everybody, you know, everything is being absorbed. You're not really sure if you're being singled out or not. Whereas if you get targeted, if, you know, you find a GPS tracker on your car, you're like, oh, they're really tracking me. Right, so those are a lot more expensive. They're a lot higher risk. You can, you know, you can be given away, you get made. Um, so the idea here would be like, if we can make these kind of supply chain attacks more expensive, right, and maybe push the, the activity somewhere else, right? I mean, that's the problem is, it's like a balloon, right? You squeeze on one end, all the air goes to the other end. I don't know. But anyway, takeaways here, you know, don't be like uh, General Haig. <laughs> Don't rely on horses in a mechanized universe. Um, wear your seatbelt, even if you have traction control, uh, you should still wear your seatbelt and have airbags in your car. Um, now, I did want to come back to this guy, right? Because uh, one thing about him, I mean, he did, you know, lead the British uh, and not, uh, all the allies into like just huge amounts of casualties, but he did adapt. So by the end of the war, um, you know, he basically uh, commanded uh, the Allies during the Hundred Days. That was probably the greatest. Uh, a lot of historians think probably the greatest uh, British military victory ever. So he realized, he, you know, that uh, he had kind of, you know, screwed everything up and made the adjustments necessary. So it was kind of a redemption story there at the end, I guess. Um, and then one last thing to just think about, right? I mean, like we said earlier, there's no silver, bu silver, silver bullet, right? We're not gonna, you know, uh, completely eliminate risk. We're just gonna be able to reduce it, right? I mean, that's the main thing is we gotta be realistic about what's, what's possible and what's not. All right, um, that's it. Thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate everybody. If anybody does have, uh, we've, we do have more time. Um, so if anybody's got more questions or wants to talk about anything else, uh, I'm, I'm definitely, I'll be here for a few minutes. Thanks. <laughs>